Well, thanks for joining us for this episode of the IET Bookshelf with me, Mark Reynard. And joining us for this episode is Lewis Dartnell, author of The Knowledge. So how would you go about restarting civilization following a worldwide disaster? I mean, this is really pertinent stuff. The knowledge explores the history of science and technology to explain in realistic detail how survivors of a mass extinction event could revive society. Holding a degree in biological sciences from Oxford University and a professorship in science communication at the University of Westminster, Lewis specializes in the field of astrobiology and the search for microbial life on Mars. He's authored several books and regularly freelances for newspapers and magazine articles. He's appeared in several science programs for the BBC radio and television. And he's also presented a TED in 2015. He makes guest appearances on the Sky at Night and Stargazing Live. Following this pre-recorded segment, Lewis will be back for the live Q&A session for you in the audience to ask about what you want to find out. So join us as we go beyond the book. So, Lewis, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Absolutely cool, brilliant. Hello. Great book. Got it here. Um, had a good read. So fantastic. Um, this is, first of all, I mean, really pertinent stuff at the moment as well. I mean, on the very back, I think the very first line on the back of the book, if I remember, it says, maybe it was a viral pandemic. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it how am I to be much more present than I, than I anticipated? Yeah, I, I think I should. I don't think COVID-19 is going to be a world ending event, but it, but it certainly got a, a degree of, of pertinence. Uh, when when this pandemic kicked off just a couple of years after the book was published, yeah. Absolutely amazing. I mean, so what inspired you to write the book? Was it the notion that these things could happen and, you you know, part of the science community, you kind of knew that these things were maybe going to happen one day soon, these pandemics, or was it just luck? It was just curiosity, to be honest. Um, so for, for all of my books so far, um, I've written the book that I would love to read myself, but, but then realise it didn't exist yet. So I said, well, I'll sit down, <laughs> we'll do the research, I'll do the writing and I'll, and I'll make that book. But what I really want to do with, with this one, with the knowledge, is it's not actually got anything to do with the end of the world at all. I, I'm not some doomsday prepper with a placard around my chest of the end of the world is nigh. But what I wanted uh, to do with this concept with this conceit of the end of the world and the loss of everything that we take granted in our everyday lives is just use that as a way of looking behind the scenes you know kind of peering behind the curtain of our modern world and therefore being able to ask where does stuff come from how is it made how is it done all the stuff that civilization does behind the scenes for us that we just take for granted we pop down to the supermarket we pick up some food we pick up anything from the shop we deliver it online um from from online shops but where does it actually come from? And therefore, if you ever needed to, if there ever was some kind of civilization collapsing event, how do you go right back to basics and do all of that yourself? So I found the knowledge quite an empowering book to, to research, finding out all of this really fascinating stuff about how you could make and do things from scratch for yourself. And did you find that the, the research that you were doing was already, a lot of it was already in there from kind of the stuff you were interested in? Or did you have to spend a big chunk of time researching what on earth you would do in this situation? <laughs> no, I, I spent a whole lot of time researching for this. And it wasn't just library research. It wasn't just reading books and history books and searching online. I spoke to an enormous number of experts in lots of different fields. You know, what is what is the very... Um, essence of your field of study. What would you want to preserve if all else was lost that would be the most important thing to remember and have written down in some kind of manual that will allow you to rediscover everything else? But actually what I found most exciting, most fulfilling for this particular book project was getting some hands-on experience actually making and doing things for myself. So I did a whole range of different projects of, of sort of Robinson Crusoe type stuff. So I made some, some glass from scratch using only the raw materials that you can gather for yourself on a beach. You can make glass from just stuff you find on the beach, so like sand and then coral. And then the argument I made in the book is once you've got glass, if you know how to mold that glass into a special shape, into a lens, you've now just invented a microscope, a telescope, you're inventing the tools for rediscovery, the tools for science. So that, that was hugely, a huge amount of fun for me of just doing these projects up and down the country, of working with people, working out for myself, 
how do I actually do this? And did you it's actually do any of them? Did you actually physically make some glass or, or did you just learn the techniques you would have to learn, if you see what I mean? Yeah, I did. Um, and I've got some of the things here. It's going to be a bit Listen, no, this is going Here's great. what I made earlier. Um, so this is the, uh, the glass that I made from scratch on my Robinson Crusoe beach. You can wow. see that in the middle of this, so it's a, a thin pane of glass. In the middle is this little dimple or nipple, which you'll probably recognize from, you know, old country houses, the windows or an old pub. And that's because when you, using a primitive technique, you're trying to make a very thin piece of glass for a window, you blow it using a glass blower's pipe, and then you basically pop the bubble and kind of squash it back flat again. So that's how you make uh, very thin pieces of glass to use for windows. You could have molded that glass into a lens for a telescope or a microscope, uh, as I said. So uh, you, obviously you went up and down. There must have been a lot more things than you put in the book. So how, how did you begin to consider which things were the important things? Yeah, so that actually became a, a, something of a bane of my life when I was editing the book because the premise of the book, that it was a single manual that tells you how to make everything you need to reboot civilization from scratch, from, from, from ground zero, is I had to have everything in the book that you needed that connected to everything else. It ended up being this big network of technologies and materials that you use in different combinations with each other, you know, kind of like playing Minecraft for real, which meant whenever something got edited out of the book, it then had all these knock-on effects and repercussions throughout the book. So it's really fiddly to edit and yet have it maintained true to its premise. But all the material that got edited out of the book um, was actually longer than the first book I ever had published. I had a book's length of material edited out in the manuscript before the knowledge was published. Uh, but it's all up on the website. So if you go to the knowledge.org, you can explore all the content that was edited out of the book. There's loads of videos, the how-to videos that I created of making things from scratch. So sort of maker projects you can do with your children or your friends at home on, on a rainy weekend. And um, there's lots of recommended reading lists, of sci-fi books or, or interesting history books you might want to read that kind of explore the, the same idea. Uh, so huge amounts of stuff on, on that website that got edited out of, of, out of the book. And, and since you've written the book, I mean, have you become just the friend of everybody just in case anything <laughs> happens? Are you the first person, you know, AA Lewis Dartnell on, on your phone just in case something happens and you're the person to go to? Yeah, so a couple of friends have, have told me I'll be on their uh, post-apocalyptic survival A team. <laughs> They've got me on a speed dial to, to come around. Um, but like I say, it's, 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 it's a bit of fun using this notion of the apocalypse, but I, I don't actually think it's about to happen. It was just a way of exploring the science and technology of how we got to now, how, how our modern world was created. And, you know, there we are and we've survived, but, but what would then be the biggest killer of those survivors? You know, if, if there was a hundred of us and we managed to sort of get things going in those initial stages, what would be the killer then of people? Would it be, is it disease? Is it accidents? What, 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 what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the things I, I talk about in the early chapters of the knowledge is what would you most need to know to keep yourself alive after the apocalypse has come? Because it would be the, the peak of irony to survive the end of the world and then to die of some kind of infection two weeks later because you tripped up, grazed your knee, cut yourself and, and didn't know what to do about it. So I, I talk in the early chapters about basic knowledge that keep you alive in terms of how do I know for a fact that the water I'm about to put to my lips and drink isn't going to kill me. It, it's not laced with waterborne diseases and pathogens, which have been the scourge of humanity for thousands and thousands of years. What sort of survival life hacks could you use uh, in terms of medicine or cleansing a wound if you get cut and there are no more hospitals and no x-ray equipment that you can go and use? So there's Things you know, things you might have in your in your handbag or your backup you take to school and to work, you can use in strange and new ways. You can combine them in different ways. So something like vodka or other spirit or alcohol is very good at cleansing and sterilizing wounds. But a bottle of vodka could save your life. Something like super glue to very very quickly close wounds before they get infected. So in chapter two, I talk about these sort of survival life hacks, how you can use everyday items in strange and new ways to save your life if, if you ever had to. Brilliant. And, you know, do you think that there would be certain people who are just naturally better, you know, are people who are outdoorsy type people, are they going to survive better than kind of city folk? Or are people who live in cities going to be able to survive better because they'll know kind of where things are in a city? And is that the best place to go to find all this extra stuff? 
Well, as we said, you, you want a, a, a mixture of different skills on, on in your community that's trying to rebuild again. So if someone happens to live in a tea, but they're really good with their hands and they maybe grow a lot of, you know, food for themselves or vegetables and allotments, they can be just as helpful to someone who lives out in, in the countryside before this sort of hypothetical uh, apocalypse uh, came along. But what I would recommend if, if this ever were to happen is you probably want to get out of the cities as quickly as possible. Because when you think about it, cities are really artificial things, that they're little bubbles that are only sustained, that only kept going by an entire civilization behind them, generating electricity to power you know, the, the street lights or the lifts taking you to the top floor of your apartment block. It's, it's not like you can grow any food in a city because everything is smothered in tarmac and, and concrete. And I wouldn't know where to go. I live in London, live in, Ham in, in Hammersmith in West London. I wouldn't know where to go to get groundwater that's safe to drink. You know, where are the wells in cities nowadays? You certainly can't drink the river water. So I would recommend you get out of a city, get out of this artificial bubble that only exists because the civilization is supporting it and go somewhere nice and rural and quiet where you've got good fertile soil to start relearning farming and growing food for yourself once you, you can no longer scavenge canned food in abandoned supermarkets, somewhere where there's you know, a clean source of water, maybe near a forest where you've got lots of raw materials and that sort of wood for rebuilding with, for using as firewood. And, and use firewood not just for keeping yourself warm, but for driving all the chemistry that you need to create for everything that we take for granted. There's a whole chapter in the knowledge on, on just basic chemistry, which you could do for yourself on a weekend if you wanted to, to make some soap from scratch, to, to make all these other things that we use in our everyday lives. So definitely grab a Ray Mears as well at the same time. You want, you want a survivor expert. So there's a bit of camping, but then knows how to not freeze to death in the first weekend. <laughs> so now, now, obviously, you go into quite a lot of detail on those initial steps following the disaster. And, and at the beginning of, of, of the pandemic we've seen at the moment, we saw that shops had severe shortages. There was panic buying. You know, so it has... This changed your view and advice on how survivors should proceed. I mean, you were just talking then about don't be in, this, in the cities and lots of people are choosing now to kind of move out of the city. So in some respects, has this changed your sort of look on how things are, having seen little edges of, of a, a global pandemic come alive, as it were? Mm, so, so one of the things that I would hope someone would take away from having read the knowledge is just a little more understanding, a little more appreciation of everything that we take for granted without having really thought about it, but not, not having put any, any, any mind to it in the past. And what certainly happened in the early weeks and months of this COVID-19 pandemic was the global distribution chains and supply network started, started, graining, started groaning and, and kind of coming apart at the seams and things were not on supermarket shelves anymore. So, so things like toilet paper, because people, because it's hard to have lots of toilet paper in a, in a supermarket because it's bulky and takes a lot of space, but doesn't make much profit for the supermarket. So that was one of the first things to run out. Flour ran out uh, in supermarkets, not because we weren't growing wheat anymore, or weren't grinding it into flour, but because this totally unexpected aspect of the supply chain is that most flour was being uh, supplied to restaurants and wholesale caterers and they didn't have enough bags that were small enough to put that flour into a small household, you know, kilogram of flour. So it really highlighted for all of us in the developed world a little bit of that process about how something gets from the field onto the supermarket shelf or from the factory to the supermarket shelf in this global network of, of, of supply, uh, supply chains around the world. Um, and therefore made us appreciate that just, just a little bit more in our, in our everyday lives. Yeah, that's, I mean, the, the flour situation was amazing, wasn't it? You know, I mean, people panic bought the bread, so everybody then started panic buying the flour, and Did then there was not enough flour. sourdough, uh, Mark? Because that's something you picked up. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I, I mean, we, we, we through, the, through COVID, we, we made bread, we did all of that, but we made bread before, so it was, wasn't like we were doing it more, actually. We were just doing it more as a family, I suppose. We brought but, people together having a lot more time to spend. At, absolutely. At home with family. We, we, were, we were incredibly lucky to um, both have jobs that, I mean, that, that could carry on. Um, and, uh, and, and I worked from home and, and my wife works, uh, she's a teacher, so she works at school. But um, 
but it, but what it did is it allowed us to get more part of the community. So for the first time, because it's a bizarre thing, but you know, we, we were always starting work before school and always finishing work after school. So we had wrap rounds for, 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 for our child, but, but because of COVID, we could walk to the school and pick him up at the school gates and meet other parents. So suddenly we've gone from being in a village where we hardly knew anyone to where we've met just about everyone. Yeah, what a fantastic thing that's happened. So, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing, but there are good things that have come out of it. And you have to feel like that, I suppose. There's something really interesting with um, sourdough bread making, which, which a lot of us got into, is effectively what you're doing is primitive microbiology. You know, there's bacteria and mold all over the place. But what you're doing with sourdough bread making is selecting a particular kind of, of microbe yeast, with the lactobacillus bacteria, which which makes it sour. So when you're going through that process of having your flour mixture, diluting it, re, pop, uh, topping back up again, throwing halfway, topping back up again, you're doing basic microbiology. You're creating the conditions that are selecting the right kind of yeast and the right kind of bacteria that you want to then make the bread. Um, and if you start mastering that kind of process, the next step is you know start mastering microbiology to make penicillin, for example, to get antibiotics out of basic microbiology. And, and do you think that actually just going, let's sort of going down this little rabbit hole of, of unusual stuff here, do you think that, you know, um, those in, is it harder to make stuff that is similar today? So, you know, a penicillin capsule now is this little capsule with little beads inside and slow release and all this kind of stuff. If you were trying to make penicillin, you'd want to make it how it was made 80, 100 years ago in its more simpler form. Is it, is it any easier? Is it a lot easier to make it how it was made originally? Yeah, so with, with penicillin, for example, isolating the penicillin mould is, is ludicrously simple. If you've got some stale mouldy bread in your kitchen, there's a very good chance that, that some of that mould on there is penicillin. Um, penicillin. And it was, it was a serendipitous discovery um, where the scientist discovered mm -hmm. the mould and the antibiotics on it. So one of the core ideas behind the knowledge is if you are doing everything from scratch again, you won't have to rely on serendipitous discoveries, random chance discoveries, because I'll tell you the most ex important experiments to try. I'll tell you what to look out for. And then once you've realized that this mold stops bacteria growing around it, that should give you that sign, that inspiration to realize, oh, well, maybe we could use that to stop mold, sorry, stop bacteria in our bodies. We could use that to fight infection. So the actual trick with making antibiotic penicillin as a product is not growing the mold and creating the, the antibiotic, but it's actually purifying it. It comes back down to the chemistry again of how you purify the antibiotic out of all the other gunk that's in the mold, which you certainly don't want to start ingesting or certainly not injecting into your body because that will kill you as, as quickly as, as the infection will. So one of the main developments uh, in the 1940s and Second World War in the mass production of penicillin was perfecting that chemistry to mass produce the, the purification. So quite often, you know, you can reinvent soap and, and leapfrog over hundreds of years in the Middle Ages because that is a very simple thing to, to make if you know how. Other things, actually, there is more of a nuance to it. There's more of a trick um, to make it useful to, to mass produce it. Now, you know, we, we, you, you talk there again about you reusing stuff and all those kind of things. A lot of the buildings that are, are built now in London are massive, big sort of metal structures with concrete and very difficult to sort of rebuild somewhere else. Whereas, you know, Hadrian's Wall, a lot of it's disappeared because it was rebuilt on farmhouses and has been sort of moved around. So the actual stones have been kind of reused in other things. And you, you talk there about limestone and getting out. It, it, is, you know, it was, is concrete really still that important? And, you know, we apparently we nearly lost it during the Roman Empire times. Um, and do you think that civilization, civilization could be fully rebuilt without concrete, or are we definitely going to need to use concrete again? Yeah, again, con concrete is, concrete often seems quite a boring material. Like a lot of buildings thrown up in the 1960s on the redevelopment after the Second World War were just thrown up without too much thought to aesthetics and concrete. And it's got a bit of a bad name for itself. But again, when you think about it, you sort of go back to the fundamentals of what concrete is. It is an absolute wonder material. It is liquid rock that you can pour into whatever shape you like. You just pour it into a mold and then it sets hard as stone. You, you can construct buildings as really simple material to pour and mold and, and form it into whatever you need. And I explain how you make concrete. Again, the, the sort of the material science behind it, the chemistry behind it is really very interesting. And it was first used in a big way by the Romans. It gave them enormous technological capability because concrete can also set underwater. Concrete doesn't set really by drying out. It sets through a chemical process, so it will still set even underwater. And that allowed the Romans to build harbors 
where there were no natural bays and then that you know, one of the reasons that enabled them to dominate the Mediterranean uh, basin. And throughout history, we did lose for hundreds of years after the fall of the Western Roman Empire that knowledge of how to make concrete. We kind of needed to, to reinvent it. And so the idea for the knowledge is, could you prevent that sort of thing from happening again if our civilization were to ever collapse? Could you avoid another dark ages that last for a thousand years if you've got this useful stuff recorded and written down? So useful science and technology and engineering is not lost to history again. So people don't have to reinvent it by chance or by luck, they've got it written down this, in this blueprint for civilization. And, and it's amazing because, you know, we lost, in, in, in the United Kingdom, we lost all of that kind of technology the Romans bought, you know, road building, you know, water carrying, you know, in terms of diverting rivers and, and you know, and coal, sewage. And Romans used all the coal in Britain as well. All of those things. And then, you know, we, we, we had this dark ages, um, which, which is kind of like what we're talking about in the book, really. How... How on earth did people go about wandering past a building that was built by the Romans and not think, how was that built? And it's, it's a mind boggling to kind of think that people went back to building with wood when the Romans had shown you could do it with much better material. So I think with, with that example of using stone rather than wood, you'll, you'll use what is most appropriate to a current situation. And if you've got an axe, you can walk into the forest and chop down some wood very easily and simply and make a house for yourself that is perfectly adequate for the next 20 years for you and your family. That's what we'll get on with doing because quarrying and then dressing and then building the stone is much more laborious. And so therefore, even within Rome, you know, it was, it was the monuments and the big civic buildings, things which were built to impress people were built in stone. Whereas a lot of, you know, everyday buildings and the habitation and people's, you know, houses and sheds and things were still built, built with, with wood. Um, but absolutely, during, during the Middle Ages, people were in awe of, of this, you know, unthinkable capability of the ancients, of, of this civilization that came before them that seemingly knew how to do much more and was much more powerful and, and capable uh, than they were in the, you know, the 1100s, 1200s. And that's likely to happen if our civilization would ever collapse. You know, imagine a hundred years in the future, some goat herd in the outskirts of, of this place that perhaps was once called London would see these towering wrecks and ruins of the ancient skyscrapers. They would probably wonder how on earth would you have built something as, as tall as a mountain? Um, there's, there's a lot of great sci-fi literature, books and films that play with that idea of, of, of losing what we hold most dear and then how it might be considered in the future. And again, I mentioned that the book's website, but there's, I have a top 10 of best post-apocalyptic sci-fi books and films to watch that you can yeah. entertain yourself with. And it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because you look at those buildings and actually um, you'd, you'd have this kind of want to be able to do it, but wouldn't have the, the cranes and the engineers and the, all of the things that need to go behind building the skyscraper, but you'd be able to see someone did. Yeah. Um, do you think having that kind of previous knowledge, that kind of uh, insight into what was before would help or hinder you? you know, or is it a case of both? With a lot of things, if, if you once you know something is possible, it becomes much, much easier to reinvent it or recreate it yourself. And we see that through the history of technology. Once one cultural civilization creates something, it then spreads very quickly because either people see see the finished product and you know, reverse engineer it in, in sort of in a basic sense, or that technology diffuses around the world. And um, and yeah, what's your, what would your one major or two or three major ideas that you would want written down apart from this in the book or passed on um, to help people what, what are the things is, is it you know is it is it the kind of building materials and building, or is it healthcare? or what, what are the kind of things that really get you going I mean, I mean it's all important right it all connects to each other um but i think in terms of a simple idea to conceive of that that if you could travel you know two thousand years into past would made a phenomenal difference to history um this notion of germ theory the discovery in the mid 1800s the reason people get sick is because there are things which are so small they're invisibly tiny they get inside your body they grow they, they make you ill we call them bacteria and germs nowadays but imagine jumping in a time machine going back to ancient rome and not just telling people about germs but actually being able to prove it to them because you know how to make your own glass from scratch you know how to mold that into a still shape to make a lens you construct a primitive uh, microscope and you show people you demonstrate that these germs exist and therefore germ theory. Imagine 2,000 years 
where people understood about infection and disease and what you might need to do to stop a plague. And it's got nothing to do with mal area. It's got nothing to do with bad air or bad smells. It's things which can transmit from one person to another, and therefore what you could do to stop that. So I thought that would be the knowledge, the single kernel, the single seed of knowledge I think would be most useful. Um, the bit of engineering, the bit of technology that I think would be most useful uh, would be a lathe. And a lathe is, is a very simple uh, machine tool. And all it basically is, it's sort of a base uh, with two stands on either side and a spindle that, that turns in the middle. And you can run along a, a, a tool, a cutting edge along something as it spins. So use a lathe if you are turning wood to make you know, a candlestick hold or the, the leg of a table. But you also use a lathe if you're making a cannon or the cylinder of a steam engine. So a lathe is in fact one of the most useful machine tools throughout history, from thousands of years ago from, from wood into more, more recent uh, versions where we're turning metal and making pistons out of it. And what's even more amazing about the lathe is a lathe is all you need to make another lathe. It is a machine that is capable to reproduce. It can replicate like, like an organism can. And in fact, a lathe can make not only other lathes, it can make a milling machine, it can make a drill. It can basically make all the other bits of machine tools you've got in a modern workshop all comes down to that one original machine tool, which is the lathe. So if I were asked, if, if the, uh, the Prime Minister came to me and said, Lewis, we've spotted this asteroid, it's heading towards the Earth, it's going to hit in six months, we have to preserve what we can, so the people that survive have some hope of, of recovering, I'd put a copy in my book, I'd put a copy of the knowledge in there, in, the, in this vault, and I'd also put a lathe, because once you've got the lathe, you can make everything else from scratch from that. Fantastic, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like if there was electricity and, and computers or 3D printer, because you can kind of print another 3D printer, but you know, you'd need the electricity, you'd need the, the app and the designs, where a lathe is kind of a, an original version of that to some extent, isn't it? Um, so you, you quote as well in the book, Douglas Coupland, every, either everyone slides back into the dark ages or no one does. So do you really believe that one person with this book could, with a big group of people who are willing to listen and have some expertise, could really rebuild society? So you, you clearly need more than just a small band of, of, of survivors in order for a society to, to contain within itself, within the minds of the people in that society, enough useful knowledge of how to make and do things. You'd need more than a few dozen people. You'd probably need more than a few hundred. So I, I pick a nominal figure of a few tens of thousands in a community of post-apocalyptic survivors who have made a society for themselves they're now trying to recover. You need, you need that network. You need that society, as well as the knowledge of what to do. Um, and one of the other the, the, the things I play with in the knowledge is I, I make the point that actually only a single copy of the book needs to survive the apocalypse because in the chapter about communication, I explain in this book how to make other books, how to construct a simple printing press, how to make your own ink, how to make handmade paper. And so within the pages of the knowledge, it's almost like it's got its own genetic instructions, its own DNA that tells you how to make other copies of books. It's a, it's a book that can repro reproduce and replicate in the way that the lathe can reproduce and replicate, as we've already said. And as a final thing to show you at the end of this talk, and in this interview, um, I put my money where my mouth was, and I did exactly that. I, I reproduced, I replicated the book. So here are two pages uh, from the knowledge. It's a title page here, and then here's the page of the book that tells you how to make from scratch a primitive printing press printed on handmade paper um, using a primitive printing press. But this is framed a copy of, of the book reproducing itself, reproducing its own pages like an organism. So once you've got that knowledge and you know how to apply that science into engineering technology, everything else sort of blossoms out of, out of that kernel. And it's a balance, isn't it, as well? Because if you've got 10,000 people together, you've got to feed them. You've got to, so actually you want them to kind of be disparate enough to be in the community, but far enough away to almost be self-sufficient with a copy of the knowledge, obviously, uh, and, and then print some other pamphlets about, you know, self-supporting with food and how to make sure and, and, and get the kind of society going and then bring them back together for the bigger sort of creations that you need to do. Um, yeah, brilliant. So, you know, you printed that, you've, you've got the book out there. And, uh, you know, if we flip back now to kind of your real 
area. I mean, you specialize in the field of astrobiology uh, and this search for microbial life on Mars, which is phenomenal. And loads of things have been happening on, on Mars in the last sort of four, five, six, ten years, you know. Um, so do you think that the content of this book could be applied to a build of civilizations on Mars? I mean, if, if you and your book and enough people went to Mars, and somehow managed to have oxygen and, you know, well, weren't freezing or burnt by UV and all this kind of stuff, would you be able to use some of the knowledge to build a civilization on a different planet? So one of my biggest regrets, one of the things I'm still kicking myself over, is that I never had the idea of combining my research field of astrobiology and life on Mars with the book, the knowledge I wrote about how you go right back to scratch to make everything to support yourself and survive, and just wrote the book on the overlap, because that's effectively The Martian, which Andy Weir wrote and made millions and millions of dollars out of that idea, which is something I probably should have thought of myself, and then I could have been a millionaire, um, which would have been nice. Um, but I have had conversations with uh, engineers and scientists at NASA about extending and applying this concept, this idea of going right back to basics to think, what is the foundation of what we need to do? How do things connect to each other? How do you build up from one level to the next? Because uh, in the future, we, we are going to be exploring Mars, not just with our robots, but with humans and building colonies and habitats. And further in the future, trying to establish some kind of permanent, self-sustaining human presence, where you can't just keep sending resupply vessels from Earth, you have to live off the land on Mars. And that's basically what I'm talking about in the knowledge as well. So, so Mars presents a couple of unique problems. Um, one of them in, in the Martian, the film, is putting fertilizer into the Martian regolith. And, and Mark Watney comes up with the idea of well, using his own poo. Which, and and I, do just, I do discuss poo in the knowledge as well, about how you can uh, use poo as fertilizer without giving yourself lots of diseases. That There's a simple trick you can use. Um, but yeah, how do you make things like water on Mars? How do you make ox breathe? There's a lot of things we just take for granted on Earth that, that it supports us and keeps us alive. But you cannot take for granted on Mars. You cannot step out onto the Martian surface without wearing a spacesuit because you will be dead within the minute. So if, if we are making habitats on Mars, there's lots of these problems that all interlink um, that we would need to solve. And then miniaturize all that, put all that machinery into the pointy end of a rocket, launch it to Mars, and then unpack it when you get there. So this network of technologies and engineering supports itself and keeps the humans alive, then it grows and expands over time. Brilliant. Well, look, I know, I know for me, I'm really glad I've got your number in my phone now. And when it, <laughs> when it all goes wrong, I know who I'll be calling. But, but Lewis, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute you, pleasure. And, uh, and we look forward to the Q&A session where hopefully some of your readers will be able to ask the questions direct to you about what, you know, other things that you've written in the book. So thank you so much. Appreciate your thank time. You. And we'll, we'll catch you for the Q&A session. Bye-bye. Lewis, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us live for our Q&A. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's amazing. Brilliant, brilliant. And look, we've had some questions in already. And uh, how's things been since we last spoke? <laughs> it's been good. It's been a couple of weeks, actually, hasn't it, since we, uh, since we last spoke. I mean, I've been doing well. I've been writing uh, the new book. So that's been soaking up most of the hours of my day doing the, the research and writing. Uh, but I'm enjoying it. I, I love this process. And I believe there's some good news as well, Lewis. So you're gonna are you gonna announce that on, <laughs> so on my, my partner and I are now expecting our, our first uh, first baby, our son. So we're trying to sell up our flats and uh, buy a house together in London. Fantastic. So, uh, that is keeping both of us very busy. Yeah, it will do. And, and I suppose writing a book at the moment, you've got to get that finished then before that big day arrives. Well, tell you what. So I, I've. I've slid through two deadlines with the publishers already, but 11th of March is the hardest of hard deadlines because when I stop sleeping, as well as I understand, but when a new baby arrives, so it will manuscript will be done by end of Feb. Said, not entirely believing. <laughs> and, and, and and sneak pre sneak previews on that? Are you gonna give anything away? Yes, yeah, so what I did with uh, the knowledge, which is the book we're talking about, and then my next book, Origins, which is all about how features of planet Earth has had a guiding influence on the, on the course of human history, is I've tried to combine science and history to sort of look at the big picture, try to get the big history book. And so what I'm doing with the new book is looking into aspects of uh, human biology, well, what is intrinsic about us as an animal, as a species, about our genetics, about our anatomy, about our psychology, and how have all those features had uh, key defining influence uh, through, through the history of civilization. 
Wow, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. Now, look, I've got some questions in already. Um, mm. I'm going to start with electricity. This was one that, um, that a couple of people have asked, and, and, and I noticed as well, which was, <clears throat> you know, when the book was written, electric cars have, have really developed massively quickly yeah. over the last few years. So would it be one of those things that electric cars could really help? Should we go out and find electric cars and use them as like power banks and maybe attach solar to them? Is that something you could do? Yeah, you're right. So electric cars have you know, really sort of taken off in the last five years, which is great to see for environmental reasons. But I think in that first chapter of the knowledge when I'm talking about what you might want to prioritise when you're scavenging and foraging through the deserted cities is finding things like deep cycle lead acid batteries. So things from like golf buggies or um, like yachts and things like that. But you're right, with, with modern electric cars, they have huge capacity of batteries and all the electronics is already in there for just charging from the mains. So I guess what you want to do in the in the initial couple of weeks is forage around whichever city you're in, break into loads of uh, electric cars, drive them back to your base, link them all up into you know basically sort of a battery farm, and then attach it to some kind of off grid generator that you've made uh, attached to a wind turbine or to solar panels that, that you've been able to scavenge as well. Um, and I think that'd probably be, you know, not a lot easier now to set off, set up an off-grid system after an apocalypse, if, if it ever were to happen, of course. Now, now we spoke a little bit about how easy it is to build things. And, and you've mentioned to me, um, there's, there's a kind of a book that's sort of similar to yours that helps you to build everything as well. I mean, is, is that something that you'd need to know? Is it kind of you need to know if you haven't got someone who's good at building, that would be another book you could get hold of? Yes, yeah, so there's another great book uh, by a guy called Ryan North, who's a, a Canadian um, sort of graphic novel comic uh, writer. He's a really fun guy. We've had plenty of interesting chats. Um, but a couple of years ago, he brought out a book um, which follows very similar lines uh, to the knowledge about how you go right back to basics and rebuild. Um, his is told from a very sort of a different angle. And in one of the footnotes in the knowledge, I'm saying, look, I don't actually believe the world is about to end. This is just the premise for, for this story I want to explore. And you could imagine it's a post-apocalyptic reboot. You could imagine you're a time traveler who's formed through a, a time warp to 10,000 BC. And what would you most need to know to make yourself the emperor and know all the most useful things to you know, accelerate through history? Or, you know, you're a captain of a starship that just crash landed on an Earth-like planet. How do you build a civilization for yourself there? And he took that uh, second option, went for a sort of a time traveler's handbook of uh, what do you do to, to know all the most useful things that people hadn't sort of invented yet. Um, so it's really good. I, I would wholly recommend people look up uh, Ryan North's book and have a read of that as well. Now, we, we've got a question come here in, in just this, this sort of in the last five, 10 minutes, which is uh, from Dominic Hayes. And, and he loves your thought provoking, but really loves it. Um, he said, what's in your emergency grab bag kit and have you got one? <laughs> I do not have one. I am a really awful prepper. And if you were ever to come around to our flat in, in West London, you'd probably see about I don't know, a day's worth of food in the cupboard. So I, I, we are not prepping. I, I don't really believe there was that to end, as, I, as I'd said. But I do think this thought experiment about what are the most useful things that you have in your possession that you could use? And I think people are aware that maybe something like an axe for chopping down trees would be useful, getting some medicine and, and things like that. But I think perhaps an even more fun thought experiment is how can you hack and bodge everyday items and use them in weird and wonderful combinations with each other to keep yourself alive and keep yourself going, use them in, the, in, in sort of functions other than what they were originally designed for. So for example, could you survive the apocalypse if you only had the contents of a handbag with you or with a, your, your school bag? And so I could explore things uh, along those lines, like how something like super glue can save your life if you get injured, how you can use a pair of glasses to start a fire, how an empty plastic bottle of water can even be used to purify water before you drink it. So loads of sort of interesting ideas like that as well, uh, alongside you know, an actual grab bag or go bag that someone might have prepared. And, 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 you know, books, you know, one of the things that you've mentioned before as well is that books, obviously, if they get wet or mm. over a period of time, they de degrade. So so you've done something quite cool with with, uh, with a Kindle, haven't you? Yes. The idea here is that if you thought the world actually was about to end or it has and you're trying to, you know, sort of forage for information rather than just materials and gadgets and, and a library about what what you would most need to know when you think about it. Actually, books are one of the worst ways you could try to preserve human knowledge for long periods of time, but because the pulp trees, the paper, it molds, it rots, if it gets wet, if the roof starts falling down in the libraries and it burns once the cities are sort of burning down because no firefighters left. But actually, when you think about it, you don't really need to have a physical library with physical books in it. You could get something like a Kindle or other e-reader and load an entire library into the palm of your hand. You can put something like 10,000 books onto the memory of this device. 
And as long as you then rig it up to sort of solar panels or something so you can keep it recharged after it goes down, you can have the sum total of human knowledge in your hand available to read for you know, decades and decades before it starts degrading. And I think I showed this in the, in the original interview, um, but here is the Kindle device that, that I hacked and, and bodged for myself. Um, it opens up like a book. There's a copy of the knowledge on there, uh, along with 9,999 other useful books, including Ryan North's. Um, and you can just recharge it. You've got the solar panels on the, on the back there. So you can just lay it out in sunshine. Not at the moment, because it's drizzling quite heavily in London. Um, but the, the thought experiment there is that, that you've got access to that knowledge if you need it. And what sort of time does it take for that to, to recharge with your solar panels on there? I mean, it clearly depends on, on how bright the, bright the sunshine is, but I've tested it, and it you know, Kindles have got uh, quite small batteries that will charge in, in a couple of hours. Um, but the other idea here is that once the Kindle starts failing, once the solar panels start degrading, which they will do over several decades, if you are in this sort of post-apocalyptic reboot scenario, you would essentially have to manually download that information again. And I explain in the book how to make paper from scratch, I explain how to make pens, I explain how to make ink, I explain how to make a printing press from scratch, so that the book kind of contains this genetic information for its own reproduction. And you could start printing back onto physical paper, back into physical books, the information that's contained digitally on this apocalypse-proof Kindle, you know, 50 years after the apocalypse has come when your society is back onto its own feet and is needing to know what the, what the next stage of, of recovery is. Brilliant. Now we've got a question here from Steve Spreadbra. Um, when you were finding out how things were made or, or, or done, did anything leap out as something that we should or perhaps could do now better uh, than, than, than actually you were sort of researching? Yeah, so one idea I, I played with when I was researching writing knowledge was, could you do it better the second time around? Or might you be forced to take a different trajectory, a different route through this network, this web of scientific discoveries and technological inventions? And particularly with the, the sort of current climate, um, literally with, with climate change, could you reboot very differently from how we did it in our own historical progression, which was using you know, basically the free energy available underground by digging up coal, by, by sucking up oil. Could you have a green reboot, for example? And it's probably fair to say that all of the easily suck upable crude oil has already been sucked up by modern industrial civilization. And we're going to greater and greater lengths and talking about things like tar sands of getting these hydrocarbons. So you probably wouldn't get easy access to crude oil if we started again. But having said that, there is still an awful amount of coal left underground that we haven't dug up and we should leave there if we know what's best for us um, to, to avoid the worst worst form of climate change. But if you are a small society starting up again, you don't really have any other easy options. Of course, you'd go for what you need to support yourself. Uh, so perhaps coal could, could form that early uh, industrial revolution again. And, and there's a, there's a sort of a, another question coming in that kind of adds on to that, really, which is David Curry, um, post apocalypse, how would you hope that so the society we rebuilt differed from the current one? And, and what would the major difference be? I mean, obviously, we just talked there about not burning hydrocarbons yeah. and those kind of things. But what else would you hope was different? Uh, well, this is actually something I deliberately avoided when I was researching the knowledge and, and writing the book, because I wanted this to be primarily a science book. It's about what you need to know to help yourself to build a society for you. And I, I did sort of toy with putting almost sort of a po-faced 10-step guide to establishing a democratic democracy for yourself. And then I realized that you can write that down, but people aren't going to necessarily pay attention to it. And, and certainly in the early days after the you know the dissolution of society and the evaporation of, of the police force and, and sort of law and order. It, it will come into a world, I'm, I'm certain, of sort of dog-eat-dog -dog and, and survival of the fittest and, and the strongest people exploiting each other, as has happened you know, through, through, through history. And it doesn't really matter if you tell people how to establish democracy because the social conditions have to be appropriate for it to start up. So I avoided things like, um, like sort of politics and how to create a society for yourself, because I think that's something that will happen innately in its own time. Uh, the other, other huge topic that I realised I just physically, I simply couldn't put into the book, but is utterly, um, utterly crucial for developing a society and civilization for yourself uh, is mathematics. And the whole of mathematical knowledge is contained in a quick little footnote at the bottom of the pages where I'm basically trying to <laughs> cover my own back saying, look, I get that math is important, 
but you can't really write about maths in, in a science book in the way you can how to make an internal combustion engine or how to make crucial chemistry like acids for yourself um because well a because it's a bit boring to try to explain like how to solve a quadratic equation um but it's hard to see that the maths in our world is there of course but it's behind the scenes and so for the conceit of this book i thought i'd focus on sort of physical objects physical artifacts and chemistry and, and medicine and um, and that sort of knowledge that, that people would be able to engage with, I think, a bit better. Now, we've got one here from, from Emma. Um, it says, Lewis mentioned communication earlier. Any thoughts on accessing certain areas of the electromagnetic spectrum? Or is that not a fundamental post-apocalyptic need? No, I absolutely think it is. And I explain in uh, the communications chapter of the book um, how to reinvent basic technologies like uh, the telegraph. So how you can create wire how you can create a battery, how you can send you know, electrical impulses down that wire. There's an interesting thought experiment about whether the telegraph could have been invented a great deal earlier than we did in our own history, because even back into the ancient Greeks, they, they knew about metal smelting. They knew how to make things like brass and, I'm sorry, about bronze um, and, and copper. So you could, in principle, have an ancient Greek civilization that's reinvented the battery, reinvented things like copper wire, if only they knew how, if only they had a copy of the knowledge that's formed through a time warp that told you how to, how to do it you could have had an ancient Greek or an ancient Roman telegraph network. And, and imagine how differently the Roman Empire might have gone if you didn't need you know, fast riders on a horse changing every couple of hours as the horse gets exhausted, but you just send electrical impulses across your empire to you know, coordinate all your activity and your economic output. And then of course, after the, the telegram, the telegraph uh, radio and transmitting and being able to broadcast, not just between one person and another who happen to be connected by a wire, you can broadcast generally across your entire society. And it turns out that actually your radio is pretty simple to make. Um, you can do something like a spark gap generator and you can receive radio waves and, and, and turn them back into sound waves your ear can hear using simple uh, minerals and crystals. So primitive forms of radio are called um, crystal receiver sets. And there's a story I tell in the knowledge about how uh, in POW camps, prisoner of war camps, when people are affected in their own sort of localized apocalypse, they've been cut off from the outside world or under you know, some draconian rule, but they were building radio sets, receivers, they could listen to the news of the, of the, the war effort in the BBC out of bits of barbed wire that they could have nicked out of the, uh, the prison yard. Um, and a rusty razor blade uh, performs that same rectifier function. You can make it work a bit like a transistor to uh, strip that audio wave off of the radio wave. So I describe all of that in, in, in this whole chapter in the book. It's, it's a fascinating area of, of, of science. And, and beside making the glass and paper that you've described and the solar panel, mm. uh, Kendall and other things, have you tried any of the other techniques yourself? I mean, you know, the, there's what, the big chapter on medicines. How, have you, you know, 2000? I have not been licking fungus to try to get <laughs> medicine. That's, if this is where the conversation is going, Emma. <laughs> Um, so I did, do, I did do lots of these sort of fun maker projects when I was researching the book. I wanted to not just make this a library project of looking information up or speaking to very clever people about their own fields of, of understanding, but, but also to actually physically make and do some of these things uh, over the course of a weekend. And I think in the interview, we talked about how I made some Robinson Crusoe glass from scratch on, on a single beach, because that's where you get all the, the raw ingredients. Um, I made a uh, photograph, made a selfie. Uh, from scratch. I printed a page of the book, um, which I've, I've got down here. In fact, I can show you. Uh, but this is um, effectively, this is the book reproducing itself. This mm. is the title page of the knowledge and uh, the page in that book that explains how to make a simple printing press from scratch, printed on a simple printing press and, and then egotistically framed. Um, what I actually enjoyed, uh, one, of, one of the things I enjoyed most of these sort of fun little maker projects was something I don't think we talked about in the interview, was how to make a gasifier stove. And I've got the gasifier stove here uh, that I made for the project. And you can go to the book's website, you can go to the hyphen knowledge.org. You can watch the video of this thing in operation. Uh, I demonstrated this live on the TED stage um, during my TED talk and came with an, about half an inch of burning my own face off. <laughs> Um, because what you've got with this uh, gasifier stove is basically some old tin cans. I've got one in the middle with a bunch of holes you can see that's sort of on the inside of this larger tin can. And you put some uh, newspaper, some kindling, put some uh, twigs in there, light it. And because you've got the set of holes at the bottom, it draws through a lot of oxygen to get a nice intense combustion. But you've also got holes that you can see uh, probably just about there at the top of the inner can. 
So as that wood breaks down in the heat of its own combustion, it gives off lots of smoke, which is itself combustible, gives off lots of gases, uh, like some methane, carbon monoxide, that is all still combustible. So you reintroduce oxygen to that hot mixture of gases and burn all of that as well. So this gasifier stove made out of an old baked bean can, I think in fact the, the big one was some chickpeas from the local Turkish supermarket near me in, in West London, um, it's incredibly efficient, it's, in, it's entirely smokeless when it runs. So it's the kind of appropriate technology that is being taught around the developing world for people living in shanty towns, people living in mud huts in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, so they can cook their dinner very efficiently with firewood they collect, but not be breathing that smoke in and affecting their health. But what we can also do, scale up your gasifier stove from something the size of a, an old tin can to something the size of a, of, a, of a trash can, of a dustbin, strap it to the back of a car, introduce those gasifier uh, producer gases into this cylinder of the car, and only then introduce oxygen and the spark plug and allow that gas to burn in the cylinder, explode in the cylinder, and you can drive a car using a gasifier um, plant. You, you can drive a car using wood as fuel rather than diesel, gasoline, and all these things from crude oil that we we're just talking about. If you don't have access to crude oil after the apocalypse, but you live near a forest, you can still drive your car with very minor um, modifications to it. So it's almost Mad Max stuff, isn't it? So it, it is both it was sort of a steampunk Mad Max yeah. crossover. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's lots of sort of people in the world who believe the apocalypse is coming already. How have they reacted to your book? Uh, you know, have you had any feedback from sort of the people who are building themselves sort of big dugouts and you yeah. know, mansions under the ground and all that? Have they, have they been in touch? Yeah, so I spoke to a whole bunch of preppers and survivalists when I was researching for this book because these are people who've been thinking about this for years and years before I sat down to, to research and write the knowledge. And the people I spoke to had very interesting conversations with. They're, they're um, succinct and, and, and sort of honest about their, their beliefs and, and the apocalypse happening, even though I don't personally believe myself it is about to. But what's interesting is if, uh, as every author, you're always told never ever read the reviews on Amazon and the, or other online book place. Uh, and the first thing you do as an author is of course you go immediately to the online book place, book marketplace, uh, to read what people have been saying. And on the whole people have appreciated and found very interesting, which was you know, delightful and very fulfilling for me as an author. But a lot of the negative reviews have come from preppers and survivalists I think because they were disappointed, I didn't have enough about how to kill a man with your bare hands or how to skin a bear with your teeth. And, and these sort of like bear grills, um, wilderness survival type skills, which was never the book that I set out to write. You know, those books exist. You can go to the library, you can go to, to a bookshop and, and pick them up. But I think the book that did not exist um, was the book about how you actually rebuild a society. Like, you know, it's not just about surviving on the day to day and making a snare or a trap to catch a rabbit. It's about how you reboot a civilization with, with engines and chemistry and medicine and all these things we just take for granted in our modern lives and, and basically forget about it because it's, you know, it's behind the scenes, it's invisible in the modern world. So if, if you could have like, I don't know, let's say um, <clears throat> the A-team of the post-apocalypse world, <laughs> who would you have on it? Who would be the... Well, Mark, clearly, I would want you. Have, have you got Thank you. I'll skills? be your communications officer <laughs> and, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, but apart from me then, you know, I'm quite handy. I've got a hammer. That's, that will be all right. But, but who else would you... If you could pick some people around the world now that you think... Don't, I mean, you, you spoke about Bear Grylls there. Would he be your man to come and get the food and do all those bits then, find the water and all that. Um, yes, yes. So someone like Bear Grylls would be really useful, um, or Ray Mears, someone that, that knows these sort of wilderness survival skills would be really useful in the early days. But then I guess basically for your post-apocalyptic A-team, your survival team, you'd want effectively a microcosm, a cross-section of societies we have already. You'd want someone who's good with their hands as a mechanic. You'd want someone who is a carpenter, can work with natural materials like wood and timber. You want someone who knows how to work in a, in a metalworking workshop and has to use something like a lathe and a milling machine, because those are the tools, those are the bits of kit that you make society with, that you build all the components that, that we, we live with. Um, you clearly want a, a doctor or a nurse or a medic that knows how to put you back together again if you if you, uh, you know, have some bad luck in this post-apocalyptic world. But I think this is, I've had many like really fun conversations down the pub or in a cafe with friends, playing through this, this thought experiment of which of your mates would you want on your apocalyptic survival team? And perhaps it wouldn't be, you know, Colin the accountant <laughs> who, whose skill set is perfectly suited for the modern world, but perhaps doesn't have 
many hands-on uh, skills that you would need if you're having reboot again. And by the way, I would be utterly useless myself. I'm a scientist and I have to research from the internet and go to a library and write books. I didn't really have to do much apart from these few projects that I've done when I was researching the book. And, and, and just going to that, without the knowledge, the actual book, how much of the knowledge could you remember if you had to with the A-team? So let's say that you do say I can come along and, and there's Ray Mears and, 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 and some, a great carpenter and yeah. a doctor. Would we want you? <laughs> Would you be able to remember the stuff to this, help this us? Feels, this feels almost like a job interview, but for my own survival. <laughs> do you get to come into the bunker, Lewis, or do we just take your book and, and yeah. have off? Um, I would say in my defence that the book is literally the very tip of the iceberg of everything I had to research. Um, and when I submitted the first draft to the publishers, uh, to Penguin Random House, uh, it was about 150,000 words of manuscript, which then got edited down to about 90, 100, 100,000 words. So 60,000 words were taken out of, of good content and material, which is the same length as the very first book I wrote about astrobiology and the search for bacterial life on other planets. Um, so a book was edited out of, of what was actually published. And I just about remember <laughs> a lot of that. Uh, so whenever I'm, um, you you're know, coming. So, it's fine. You're I'm in. I'm in. Okay, you're great. <laughs> you're in now. You, you, we we we. I'll, I'll breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> so um, like, you know, when, when you look at films that, that that are the sort of post-apocalyptic theme and all this kind of stuff, like Walking Dead and those kind of things, um, one of the big problems is always collapse of law and order. Mm. You know, um, how do you mitigate against that? And is there something that we could do that would in our little A team of people, uh, and presumably you'd need a mix of male and female as well, because that's yeah. probably a fundamental, isn't it, really? Unfortunately, or, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it. Well, when it comes uh, to repopulating, you're, you're exactly. going to have a balance. But, but what about law and order? It always seems that law and order kind of, in these things, always sort of disintegrates and falls apart. Would, do you think that would be the case, or do you think that a small band of people would work together pretty well? So, again, it kind of depends on how disastrous the disaster was. If you, if you have a literal total collapse of society and a mass depopulation, lots of people dying, you don't have anyone to maintain that law and order. You don't have a police or law courts or prisons anymore, or the threat of punishment that on the whole keeps people you know, sort of on the straight and narrow. But having said that, in, in sort of localized disasters like Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans, for example, there was some looting, there was crime, but on the whole, people were very uh, civilised about it and helped each other. And, and I, I, I do genuinely believe that the human spirit is fundamentally a good one and we are cooperative and we help each other. And we look out for, for our you know, so fellow neighbour, which is exactly what we needed to do to build a society and civilization in the first place. You know, there's nothing sort of artificial about that. But clearly you are going to want to have a, a group of people around you uh, and safety in numbers, people you trust, to, to look after each other when society has evaporated. Mm. But, but to be fair, that's, again, something I kind of skirted around in the first chapter of the knowledge, because I, I'm not sure there's much of interest to say about that, that we kind of wouldn't already be able to work out for ourselves. And indeed, we haven't seen The Walking Dead or I Am Legend or read any number of, of popular science, sorry, um, science books, science fiction books on this topic. Um, to put one, one final plug uh, of the book's website for the knowledge, sorry, the, the knowledge.org. Um, is there's a whole list of um, books that you can go and read that, that explore this idea of, of a post-apocalyptic world, uh, as well as doing proper science books that, that tell you useful information or, or films that you can watch that, that explore this, this similar idea, um, including The Martian. Have you come across the, the film The Martian with Matt Damon? That's basically the knowledge bit on Mars. It's, it's how to go back to, to scratch and support yourself. Now, one of, one of the questions that came in was, um, you know, obviously it's been a terrible time for the last sort of, I don't know, 22 months now or something where we've all been, you know, dealing with a pandemic right across the world and, and in various countries have had it worse than, than, than others. Uh, and and, and we, we put our hands, you know, out to everybody out and, and say, you know, hope everyone's doing all right. But in this context, would you feel more prepared and did you feel more prepared when the pandemic arrived because of the research you've done for this book? Do you feel like you've, do you feel like you've survived as, as better than perhaps me? You know, I mean, I mean, obviously you don't know quite how, but, but it's, it's been a tough time. Did you feel it some way you were prepared for it? Yeah. So, so actually the very first sentence of the very first page, of the very first chapter of the knowledge is something like, uh, something like maybe it was an astro strike or a nuclear war or a global pandemic that collapsed the world. And then lo and behold, a global <laughs> pandemic has swept around the globe and, and you know, descended upon all of us. I, I would stress immediately that coronavirus, COVID-19, 
is not a civilization ending event. It's no way even near. We've been very, very lucky this time. But that doesn't remove the possibility that the next pandemic or maybe the one after that could be much more serious. Um, and we perhaps might not be able to respond as effectively as we have for COVID-19. So I think one of the main reasons I wrote the knowledge is just to hold a mirror up to our society and how things work and sort of, you know, explore that interesting area of, of understanding, but also to explore that possibility that we are not invulnerable as a society. Plenty of civilizations, plenty of great empires like the Roman Empire and the Han Chinese Empire have collapsed in the past and that could happen to us. I don't believe it is about to, but it, it's not impossible, something to sort of bear in mind. But I think after doing all of this research for the knowledge, I'm not entirely convinced I've been any better at, uh, at, at sort of weathering the, the current lockdown and, and the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. See, so what I did do, um, one of the things I didn't do first off when I was researching and writing the book was um, make some sourdough bread. And, and I explained in the food chapter about how you can effectively play at being a primitive microbiologist. You are uh, extracting from the natural environment a particular species of yeast and you're putting it through a selection process to remove other bacteria which you don't want so you now have a, a relatively pure culture of yeast and lactobacillus which you feed with your yeast uh, so with your flour which causes the the bread to, to leaven and i did that for the first time um basically last april i had a month of just knocking off the walls at home and thought i'm going to do something productive i'm going to turn to that uh, page of my book and follow my own instructions to see if I can do it to make bread uh, and generally I've still got the culture up in the kitchen we, we bake with it every single week and, and put it in the fridge to, to chart for a bit in between so um it's going I've got that's a fantastic things thing because things. you can you can you can pass that on to friends as well you can literally share the the, the, the yeast and, and, and on it, it goes yeah, exactly. you divide it up and keep it going an amazing thing um, and uh, so, start making some beer with it as well perhaps well, maybe, yeah, well, for, uh, yeah. maybe for christmas <laughs> yeah but not too early in it because we want to get the <laughs> sort out and uh, now you you've spoken about you don't think the, the apocalypse is coming but do you think it's only a matter of time before the civilization as we know it does collapse and and and, and with you know a gut feeling have we got plenty of time yet or is it coming sort of relatively soon? Well, I mean, I get, there's only two options, right? Either our current industrialized civilization continues indefinitely, continues five billion years in the future when the sun starts going to a red giant and destroying the earth. And we have to jump into starships to repopulate elsewhere. Or at some point over that very, very long period of time, we hit a hurdle. We kind of stumble, we trip over. And then as a society, we get up, brush off our knees and then get back in, into the race. And... Like I say, although I'm not being particularly pessimistic about it, I, I think you've rationally got to at least consider over very long periods of time, we probably will have another civilization collapse, as has happened multiple times in history. Yeah, scary stuff. Um, but there is no time you... soon, as I was saying. You do not <laughs> need to start stockpiling uh, machetes and guns and, and cans of food. We are fine. <laughs> it's strange that <laughs> we've seen already, as soon as you mention something like that, everybody's out and the first thing they get is toilet roll. But I'm not sure that's what we need for the... <laughs> for the end of civilization. Um, but look, Lewis, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, um, the knowledge, amazing book. Um, must just mention as well before we go um, that we have a Magnificent Women and Their Revolutionary Machines by Henrietta Heald. Great book as well on Monday, the 17th of January at 4 p.m. Uh, so that'll be 2022 as well, which is scary sort of knowledge. Um, but the, the knowledge, great book. You know, if you haven't read it, get it. And, uh, and you've got your next book coming out next year. So we'll be excited to see that. Speak to you about that then. And a baby on the way as well. So it's going yes, to be a great year. <laughs> I'm going to be uh, busy, busy next year. Exactly. Lewis, have a fantastic Christmas break. Thanks ever so much, and, guys. Uh, Cheers. And, and thank you for joining us again. Take care now. Bye bye.